Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. And then what we're doing with a Craig's test is we're trying, let's go straight towards the camera. Yeah, we're trying to see, we're trying to see if someone's resting bony position is within that eight to 15 or if it's not. So go on your stomach, Leah. And the way we do this is you're going to bend the person's knee up, right? Sorry, I'll do this side to make it easier. You bend the person's knee up and you wanna to try to palpate the greater troke, right? Where it comes most prominent to the outside, right? Which is theoretically the midpoint of their hip resting, right? So if I go like this and I palpate her greater troke, if I go all the way into IR, I don't feel her greater troke. If I come all the way into ER, I don't feel her greater troke. But if I come right in the middle for her, I feel it most prominently right there. Okay, so I try to not look and bias that, but then looking at that, I mean, Dean, you got the best angle. What would you call that IR? It's probably like 10? Yeah, it's 10, so it's normal, right? So she has a normal Craig's test, right? If I go into a Craig's test and someone has a ton of IR to resting neutral, right? You're like, oh, wait a minute. That's, that person might be, have a, a, a version, exactly, right? And if someone comes all the way to neutral here and they're like, they're like, <laughs> I just like how Grace just instantly threw shade. And like, <laughs> if she came all the way to here, and like she, she was neutral, right? That would be outside of the eight as well. And again, you don't change everything, but you're thinking about this person's resting anti-version or, or retroversion might be part of this equation to think about. A log roll test is a way we mobilize somebody after surgery to help their hip move without compressing the front of the tissue because we're in extension. But um, it's also really, really helpful to see if somebody has uh, excessive laxity of the anterior capsule, right? Because if somebody has a ton of hip extended ER, right, they have a lot of probable, probable laxity in the front of the hip joint, right, because that ER is what allows that capsule to stretch out a little bit. So, Aaliyah, come on back up. Hop on your back. Yep, so feet would be facing this way. So I have her, and I'm not going to stand directly in front of it for the camera, but we're going to have her go up this way. You put her into max e IR, and then you let go, and you see if she flops out, right? And I'll show you on me. I have excessively more on one hip. But what would happen is a positive test would be if this came out and say her left, her right leg flopped out like a ton, right? More than 20 degrees between sides is what most studies show, but more than 45 degrees as well. You would think that the anterior capsule on this side has been stretched out over time, right? Think about that right-handed hitter who swings really hard all the way on one side. Think about the gymnast, the dancer, the ballet person, the sprinter who has, is really explosive off both sides. Maybe both capsules are really, really lax. Um, but when they come out like this, you would see this big differential and you would think that maybe the anterior capsule is more lax, okay? Hop on up for a sec, you're good. So I'll show you on mine. So this is hard to fake because obviously I can't push myself, but when I go like this, right, if I completely relax, can you guys see which side is more? Right. right, see how my right foot is like well beyond? I'm not trying at all, right? And if somebody pushed me more, I could probably get equally on both, but my right side of my hip is significantly more lax from gymnastics. And the other thing you can do is a quadruped rock back test, which I think I learned um, from Aaron from Squat University early on, but it's a good way to kind of also see when somebody might round under that way. So let's go hands and knees and put your feet about hip width apart as if it would normal be and try to think about rocking backwards and maintaining a flat back and then just go as far as you can, right? So she's pretty good down to there, right? So say somebody, for example, go really narrow to make an exaggeration here with your feet, yeah. So say she comes in and she comes all the way back up to hands and knees. So say when she rocks backwards, if she has her feet really narrow and she's squatting really narrow, try to rock back, you'll probably start to see an earlier round of their back here, right? Versus if you have them come back up, bring your feet hip width apart a little bit more. If we change their squat stance out and they can get all the way back by maintaining a proper neutral curve, you could say that's probably gonna be a better squat position for that person, right? So you can play with width of knees and turnout of knees in a quadruped rock back and see if somebody changes their symptoms or if somebody is able to maintain a neutral curve all the way down, right? If they have, a, have FAI symptoms or have morphology changes and then they rock back and as soon as they get to like 45 degrees of hip flexion, they tuck under and they get a little rounding, you think that person's gonna probably wink or have FAI symptoms more so. The other thing you can play around with too that we don't have to do, but you can play with anterior and posterior pelvic tilt, right? If someone really doesn't understand how to control their spine, and they're mega arched when they do a quad rock back, that's the equivalent of trying to squat and having early symptoms probably here. So if you teach that person to cue a little bit and drive their hips back, it might modify their symptoms a little bit. Other one you do, okay, so figure four. Again, this is for someone who's hypermobile. Aaliyah's right in the middle. She's not super hypermobile. She's not super, super stiff. So the hypermobile person would like be able to really significantly like have no problem getting their foot to their uh, leg here. So you put them in a figure four, which think about the anatomy, right? ER and extension puts more stress on the anterior capsule already, 
right? This figure four position is how you stress the anterior capsule and labrum, right? I come in off the back of her femur and I push anterior medially to try to see if I slide the femoral head forward if I cause any symptoms, okay? So I'm here and I'm pushing straight that way. You okay? Pain? Yeah, and I think it probably hurts on her not because of like mega instability, but because she's not super hypermobile and I'm jamming her hip into a not comfortable position. So that would be the prone figure four. Hop up for a sec. I'll show you in a minute. I'll just, I'll show, because I have no issues here. Right, I have plenty of motion this way, and if someone were to push on my hip that way, like I'm already on the table. So if I had symptoms and I was painful, somebody pushing more into an anterior glide would feel pretty terrible. Yes. You know, the one I did want to show is the gluteal tendinopathy. So there's definitely a change in the literature that bursitis type stuff is not really shaking out to be as useful as we thought. Diagnostic injections, people don't get better, uh, and also there's not a lot of thought process to that now. So Glutamine tendinopathy is thought to be more of the promising thing that might be going on with lateral hip pain. And there's two tests that can be used to do that. One is resisted ER at, so flex your hip up to 90 in ER and then have them contract into, into that motion more because it wraps the tendon up around the greater troch and it can cause some symptoms. And then a, a lateral hip drop. So lateral hip drop is just standing here off a step and having someone do a glute med drop and kind of pull back up and back down because as you adduct more, you get compression of the tendon over the greater troch, and that's usually very symptomatic in people when you get pressure. But Elia, hop up, and I'll show this one. So on your back, right? So you would have that person flex up, right? ER more, and then have them try to pull into ER. So try to do this motion that way. Yeah. So you're, you're wrapping the uh, greater troch right up around the tendon, and then pulling, and you contract that muscle more when it's round up and compressed. It can be very symptomatic on the outside of the hip. So pull in. Right, and you just do ER that way. Yeah, so that's been a really helpful test that I've signed along with the, the hip drop test, just standing and dropping up and down that way. Right, quad rocking is a really good way to start ranging the hip and closed chain. So fake that I help him turn back over, go on your stomach, right? Teach someone to, when you push up, I don't want a McKenzie press up that sags the hip into extension. I want a piked intentional hip flex. So you have arm push up, nice flex of the hips. Start them here, walk your hands in a little bit. Right, and so now I say quad rod back, quad rock back, make sure your knees are apart if he's not, right? But only go until your hips are not on top of your knees because that's gonna be about 70 to 80 degrees of flexion, so stop right there. And just quad rocking is how they like to regain motion early in surgery for hip flexion. It's much more patient driven. They're doing the work, it's not me jamming their hip up into flexion. So I'll try to do a little bit in the, on their back to gain some motion. And then I say come back and only go until your hips are over your knees, which is 90 degrees. As we get farther in week three, week four, a little more abduction, a little more rock back to get to 120 or whatever that is. Thank <laughs> you.